In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. have indeed found no proscenium the voice of everything immersive i'm your host noah nelson this week on the show clem garrity of swamp motel dials in from london to talk about the origins of the company their work on the isklander trilogy and just how their pandemic pivot opened up incredible new doors for the swamp motel team Julie Tremblay of Phi taps in to share with us the installation side of The Infinite, their collaboration with Felix and Paul Studios that is currently in Montreal and headed to Space City in Houston in December. Also, we'll talk about how Phi Studios approaches making VR installations that define the way large-scale VR installations are presented. Plus, a very special pick of the week that is double fun. But first, headlines. Hello, this is Catherine Yu, executive editor of No Proscenium, and here's what's in the immersive headlines for October 1st. First off, some metaverse news. Earlier this week, Facebook announced that it would be spending $50 million over the next two years on funding to create programs and do research to ensure that its metaverse products are developed responsibly. Facebook currently defines the metaverse as a, quote, set of virtual spaces where you can create and explore with other people who aren't in the same physical space as you, end quote. Well, some of the partners Facebook are working with for their new XR programs and research fund include the Organization of American States, Electric South, and Women in Immersive Technologies Europe. Meanwhile, Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney, in an article in the Washington Post, described their company's very different approach to the metaverse, which does not rely upon the walled gardens of Silicon Valley. That is to say, Epic's vision for the metaverse would give users the ability to seamlessly hop from one platform to another and not be limited by a single company's virtual ecosystem. Said Sweeney, quote, A car maker who wants to make a presence in the metaverse isn't going to run ads. They're going to drop their car into the world in real time and you'll be able to drive it around. And they're going to work with lots of content creators with different experiences to ensure their car is playable here and there and that it's receiving the attention it deserves, end quote. And some hyper-reality news. The VR pioneer The Void appears to be plotting a comeback? That's according to Protocol. Apparently, some of the assets of the defunct startup have been acquired by Hyper Reality Partners, a company run by former Void investor and board member Adrian Steckel, who is looking to relaunch the location-based VR company. Key talent have rejoined the team, including the Void's former Chief Creative Officer Curtis Hickman, the former VP of Content Jason Hauer, and Steve Shaken, the former COO of Evermore. Plus, the new iteration of the company appears to be focused on creating larger, standalone entertainment venues, which include food and beverage service. It's rumored they've already raised as much as $20 million for this relaunch and have got their eyes on a Las Vegas location. And Disney has formally announced that voyages on Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser will begin on March 1st, 2022. Bookings for the bespoke live-action Star Wars adventure are set to begin on October 28th, just four weeks from today. And how much will this interactive and immersive cruise on land set you back? Well, prices for a two-night stay start at just over $4,800 for a two-person cabin during off-peak times. And these have been your immersive headlines. You know, my birthday is coming up on October 24th, just in case you were wondering what to get me this year. Speaking of October, this the greatest month of the year, sorry, every other month, is not only spooky season, it's also festival month with a host of film and XR festivals underway around the globe and on a screen near you. Let's give you a quick rundown of what's either running right now or about to pop off. Right now, Vancouver International Film Festival's Immersed is running through October 11th, and it's happening across six online platforms, including the YouTube VR 360 channel, with 16 pieces in this year's curation. 
British Film Institute's London Film Festival starts October 6th and runs through October 17th with the LFF Expanded Immersive Art and XR Strand featuring 18 projects from 13 countries. These are available both virtually and on in multiple venues around London's South Bank. 5Rs, the Festival of International Virtual and Augmented Reality Stories, kicks off in person in Los Angeles this year, October 15th through the 17th, before heading online through November 2nd. Look for more about 5Rs on next week's show. Indiecade, the International Festival of Independent Games, has multiple events this month, with the Playable Theater Live Action Game Symposium on October 16th, followed by Indiecade Festival October 22nd through 24th. And in the nominees for awards this year, you'll find the Tele Library, Candle House Collective's Claws, I Expect You to Die Too, the upcoming Savage Hall, and an ARG called the Pick Fair Direct Directive. I got that right. Uh, the latter of which our own Catherine Yu is on the design team of. Good luck to all the nominees. And, and that's not all the nominees. Those are just the ones we, <laughs> we like have dealt with in the past or are about to deal with in the near future. Uh, whether you are our friends and co-workers or not. Wink. Oh, I wasn't supposed to read that part. Finally, Raindance Film Festival's Raindance Immersive has a lengthy run starting October 27th and carrying all the way to November 21st with around 30 experiences on the docket, including favorites like Kasunda and Welcome to Respite. So, you know, if you thought you had nothing to do this month, well, you're wrong. Joining us now is Clem Garrity, the co-founder and creative director of Swamp Motel. You might know Swamp Motel from their Isklander trilogy. Uh, that would be Plymouth Point, The Mermaid's Tongue, and The Kindling Hour, which have been delighting fans of immersive work online with their ARG-esque escape antics. Uh <laughs> For, for a lot of lockdown uh, and the post-lockdown world we now find ourselves in. Clem, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. I love that intro. You said it much better than I could say it myself. Aw, thanks. I'm barely awake when I'm doing this. So sometimes I think I should just stay asleep. Yeah, I'm impressed. Um, you do this long enough and you actually do it better in your sleep because then the little voice in your head saying like, that was wrong, doesn't come up. Oh, look, he's here. Um, you and your co-founder, Ollie Jones, have been working together since university. Uh, first as part of the comedy troupe, Kill the Beast, and also with Punch Drunk. So I know our audience would be really curious as to what your trajectory was circa, let's say January 2020, just picking a random date out of that. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how you landed on that. Um, yeah, so we we did. We, we we worked together at university. That's how we met. And we, we continued to work with each other for about 10 years after that, creating theatre um, independently, together, in and out of different companies. And we loved it. We really liked creating work together. It didn't necessarily pay the bills um, as much as we enjoyed one another's company. Uh, so... We established Swamp Motel in about 2017, 2018, as a, a kind of a way to allow us to start using our creative brains and creating theater and immersive experiences, originally purely for brands, be that for corporate events or um, product launches. We noticed that a lot of brands were trying to do what immersive theater makers were doing. And we thought they were doing it pretty badly. So we thought we should set up a company that quite blatantly said to brands, you know, we'll do this. We'll do this for you. Don't try and do this yourselves. Use, <laughs> uh, use people who know what they're doing. And, and cynically, please. Yeah, 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 please. Cynically or not, we, we, you know, we'd been working in the fringe theatre world in London for a long time. And, uh, and we probably just wanted to start playing with bigger budgets and, and getting paid a bit better. So, um, I don't think that's a dirty thing to talk about. And I think it's, it's good that, that we did that. So, yeah, we were doing that for a couple of years and, uh, and thoroughly enjoying it. And uh, the start of 2020, we were, we were 
booked in with a lot of brands. We had a lot of upcoming work. These events, obviously, uh, you, you know, you're months in the planning and building of things. And then, uh, yeah, we sort of, we never foresaw having to turn our hand to creating our own stuff again, at least not for a few years. Then this little thing happened, which uh, I guess kind of halted everything. And the trajectory of work that we had planned that would take us throughout 2020 and, and 2021 uh, completely just dropped out from under us. All of the the brands and the clients that we had, uh, you know, upcoming work attached with, they they paused on everything. They they wanted to stop spending any money until they knew the lay of the land, and uh, and yeah, we suddenly had no work ahead of us. It was it was a thrilling time. You hadn't been doing original stuff, and you find yourself like all of us did with just floating in space. Was the Isklander trilogy, was this something that was like bouncy around your head already? Or or was this absolutely a just what can we do moment? Yeah, it, it was a bit of both, I would say. So we had in the back of our minds when we set this company up that the clever thing would be, oh, we'll we'll make work for, for brands and corporate clients and that will subsidize eventually um, our own independent projects. because The Christopher like, Nolan model. Yeah, one it, for exactly. them, one for us. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, many people have called us the Chris Nolans of the, uh, of the immersive theatre world. Don't include that, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, wa- we wanted to follow that model. It made sense to us. It felt a bit like we were, you know, we were being clever. And uh, we didn't think we would be able to do that this quickly. You know, we thought that would probably be year five of Swamp Motel. So, the the work drops out you know we get locked in our homes and uh we suddenly thought well first of all we're gonna go mad if we're not making something in this time that's just the way we are i think we would have gone a, a little bit uh crazy and um and secondly we thought how can we prove to clients that you can still make stuff um you can still engage audiences if anything they need engaging more than ever you know at this point and we'd all probably watched tiger king two or three times by that point so we were becoming a bit bored with netflix so we just thought um okay if we're used to creating immersive stuff that drags audience members out of their auditorium seat and and brings them into the heart of the action how can you do that on zoom how can you take this tool that we're now all becoming pretty familiar with and sort of shake it and use it in a different way that's going to upend expectations and give people a more exciting hour um, when they sit down. And we also wanted to create something, you know, people go to the theatre, immersive especially, to connect with one another, you know, discover a space with their friends and a narrative, and also with performers. So we wanted to recreate that feeling and, and, and make something on video editing software where you could hang out with your friends, but you'd also be doing something. You're not just doing a quiz or catching up with your mum for the fifth time that week because you have nothing else to do. So yeah, and then the idea for the the sort of plot and the narrative, I suppose, we suddenly could just go carte blanche. And we were like, okay, what excites us? What's fun? Um, We were kind of inspired a bit by things like, it felt natural to look at things like rear window, right? We were suddenly all trapped Mm. indoors. Um, So that, what do you do when it's literally an armchair thriller, you can't move. Um, And then also don't fuck with cats i'm assuming you're gonna oh yeah cats. don't worry about that okay great hey you know we, <laughs> we love we love to swear i'm not even used the c word yet um oh, God. okay maybe, sorry. That. maybe that isn't tough. <laughs> by c word i of course mean creativity um but yeah so we we really we watched uh we love don't fuck with cats i think because you suddenly were seeing um you were seeing people use the internet in like the most like the really digging your 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 claws into the the furthest corners of the internet right and solving a crime they were being active in that moment they were they built a community and and they solved a crime and it was really satisfying to watch and i imagine satisfying to be a part of so we sort of took rear window and don't fuck, fuck with cats um and then we also thought okay what's fun uh, someone's gone missing that's a great that's a great initial hook and then we got to dive into all the stuff that excites us. And, it's, you know, we've sort of been itching to, to explore for, for years, probably, uh, collaboratively. So we, we, we're big fans of English folklore, which I think has really been making a bit of a, a sort of revival. I think folk horror in general over the past, what, five years has, has really come 
surging back. And then we're also sort of in the heart of the city where our, where our offices are in East London. And we like the idea of taking sort of old English folklore um, and, and smashing it into this sort of glass and chrome um, modernity of, of the city of London. And that's kind of where you start when you, when you um, join part one Plymouth Point. So much of that is like right up my alley. And I wanted to like, if I'm not careful, I'm going to derail us into a discussion of uh, Ben Wheatley's uh, uh, Irv. Oh, please uh, let's. Yeah, we'll save it. We'll save it. We um, can do that. <laughs> so, well, I remember when I was at EFI. No. Um, so, so you've given, you've given a, what's great is you've given everyone a taste of what the, the flavor of the trilogy is and sort of where it takes off. And I think there's something that really speaks to the sort of the deep immersive fan there's that that process that is kind of an alternate reality game experience, but one that sort of mirrors more closely that kind of true internet detective vibe. Right. Like yeah. so many shows that have used like live shows or, or just, you know, works online that have used that format are very sticky. They're, they're really what people are, are looking for and to kind of like dig through. Um, that's not a question. That's more of a comment. So I'm I'm fascinated that like you know this is stuck because this has gotten you guys a, an IP deal to to develop this world as like uh, uh or or the world's being developed uh, for for I guess television right mm-hmm. at this point yeah um yes, how how did that come together what what a what a, what a what a pivot in the middle of of the pandemic yeah um yeah it's really wonderful i mean we we loved creating it because we could sort of go off and explore this narrative that really could could continue and can continue and um, we we used a lot of what was great about the internet is that you it's it's endless right so if you're clever about it and you use a mishmash of kind of true history and invented stuff and you're using true websites like YouTube and Google Maps and what three words and things like that. And then peppering fake websites within that, you start to lose track of what's real and what isn't. And I think that's what got people excited when they were playing the game. It just so happened we had a number of TV production companies experience the game um, and all three of the games. And we were we were sort of contacted by a number of them. And uh, they were very excited about the prospect, I suppose, of initially partly just sort of taking that narrative and turning it into a TV series, but then also the the possibility for um, exploring that sort of interactivity in a TV show. So is that about unlocking future episodes by going online and figuring out certain clues or yeah, like the, you know, what, what's oh my the God. E- extensive world that you can explore after, you know, the credits of episode two. I can only imagine in a world of like Marvel super fans, if, if it was tossed to them, it's like, okay, you want the next episode of what if you're going to have to solve this giant puzzle. It would be solved in five minutes because of the sure, desperation. Yeah. This is what people always find with this stuff, but that'd be fascinating. Yeah, I think so too. And we're, we're really excited. Yeah. Talk about pivot. I mean, we, we didn't expect it. That was, that was great. You know, we weren't going and, and knocking on people's doors and sort of showing them this product, but in a way, um, to go back to your earlier point about sort of, you know, t- 2020, it was um, it was a, a thing we wanted to do to show that you could, you know, we could still be creative in this period where everyone had to stay indoors. And, uh, and, and it's nice to have since then had, you know, clients return and ask us to create similar experiences bespoke for them. And then also this, this thing that we never would have expected, which is a TV deal and the beginning of, of, yeah, developing the TV series. Well, with, with this TV deal on the table and, and, and given you and Ollie's sort of creative history, like, you know, before and, and Swamp Motel, uh, is this going to see you guys head off out of immersive and experiential or are, are you in too deep? Is it too deep in the blood for you? I think for us, it's, uh, it's certainly too early to, want to do that at all we've got way way uh, more stuff that we want to explore and um, you know the world over here in London right now it, it's it's only really just coming back to normal in terms of uh, going being able to go back to gigs and like uh, being able to explore the city again and experiences within the city we are very excited to be developing a live show at the moment um, our first our first official live immersive experience as Swamp Motel 
which is going to launch uh, towards the end of October, uh, and it's called The Drop. That's something that w- has, has been thrilling at the moment, has been able to sort of go, okay, what do we want to do next? What do we want to explore? If there's this stuff that excited us in, in how we saw our audiences react to the Isklanda games, what if we took that grain of it and took that bit of this and jammed it together into this live experience I think people would lose their minds. You know, hopefully some of your listeners can uh, hop on a flight. Um, and yeah, we are, we're, we're launching that. So that'll be in London this autumn, winter into the new year. Um, so no, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. And also I think that the, there's been a lot of talk about how, how immersive is defined. In, in recent years, I feel like that's been a big talking point and in the industry anyway. Um, pretty lame but uh yeah i think that i think we're kind of reveling in the lack of definition in a way and maybe that's the worst thing to say but it's exciting for us to think okay what does like what does an immersive book look like that i could go and buy at the bookstore and you know is it one chapter is completely blank and you've got to figure out how to read these pages is it that i need to uh read a chapter of it in the mirror is you know does the actual content lead you to uh, something out in the real world if you crack a series of clues. Like, I think that sort of stuff is exciting us and I don't think we want to inhibit ourselves by only pursuing online or only pursuing TV show development or or purely live theatre. So yeah. we're excited about the whole cornucopia of uh, possibilities, I think. I think COVID has made us realise we can be creative in a million different ways than we ever thought we could before. That that book example you know, sounds like an extended version of House of Leaves. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's so good know. that you, uh, uh, I think we are one mind. Actually, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. So House of Leaves, that is an immersive experience reading that Absolutely. book. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are, there, are, there are albums that are immersive experiences. And I, I think- uh, There's an album yeah. linked to House of Leaves even. So like it extends, you know. There this, we go. Right. Like the the this idea that the stories- that the worlds of the stories don't don't stop when the when the book is closed or when you leave the theater, be it a a screened theater or a or a theater theater. And I think um, that is the way that um, media and storytelling is going to continue. You're seeing that in the gaming space and in movies, and and certainly I, I know and feel that's the way TV is going. So we're excited to see, yeah, how the whole industry sort of starts exploring that wider connectivity with stories that audiences are are really into and up for engaging with. Well, Clem, normally I would at this point say like, Hey, can you stick around for a little bit? And like, let's like go into after hours, but instead I'm going to ask you to come back at some point. Cause right now I, I actually have to get off to a debate about the meaning of immersive. <laughs> That's nice. where I'm headed to. Okay. Perfect. I hope I've given you some, uh, some ammo. Yeah. Uh, you have, it's, it's less of a debate. We're kind of just like setting the terms, but it's, it's just ironic uh, that that's, that this should come up. But uh, for, for those, talk again. yeah, no, yeah, totally. Uh, so for those, for those who want to catch the Isklander trilogy, where do they head right now? You can go to isklander.com and you can play parts one, two, and three. They don't have to be played in a particular order. However, you're going to get a more satisfying experience if you do play them parts one, then two, then three. Um, Yeah, you can go on there. You can experience them now. You can do them as single player or with a group of friends. Um, And we are, we're we're really excited to watch the, the, the audience for these experiences grow. It's lovely to see so many people in the US and now Australia enjoying and, and talking about the experiences um and yeah we're looking forward to uh, to seeing more people play and hopefully making more as as the years go on and when does the drop drop the drop drops very nice i'll start using that towards the end of october and i'm being cryptic because <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts um, so there'll be certain things released at certain times, but announcements are, are going to be happening in the coming weeks. And if people go to swampmotel.co.uk or follow us, Swamp Motel, on all of the usual social medias, we'll have a, a load of information that by the time this podcast is out, I'm pretty sure we will have uh, released to the world. Fantastic. Well, Clem, this was a joy. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Hey there, everybody. We've reached 
watch that part of the show where we unveil the pick of the week. Every week, the review crew meets inside our Discord and talks for just about an hour or so about the shows and events they've been uh, experiencing over the past week. And uh, we kind of make our cases as to what we think might be the absolute, you know, best thing we've seen collectively. Uh, You can hear that full discussion in our podcast feed. It's just one click back. Uh, You can also find a bunch of the writing about that in the review rundown on the site. But when it's all said and done, we have a pick of the week. Usually that's how it's supposed to work. But uh, this week, uh, you're going to see this week, uh, kicking off our pick of the week is. Hi, this is Kevin Gossett, the LA reviews editor for NoPro. And uh, Kevin, uh, you are leading us off here. So, uh, what what's uh, what's standing up uh, standing up this week in pick of the week? So, the pick of the week this week is Creep. It's uh, LA spooky season favorite, and it's back this year, and it's great. It's the uh, taking place at the Ghost Light, which is uh, JFI Productions' new kind of haunt, and they. Are when running. you say haunt, you don't mean like a haunted house. You mean like it's like their new venue, like yeah, for the foreseeable future. Their new digs, their new venue, their new uh, bar and entertainment space. So, uh, for those who don't know, creep, uh, give a little, give like a minute version of what makes this so special and why it's such an LA spooky season favorite. Yes. Yeah, so, creep is always this kind of artsy, weird, fun, sexy, cool, scary, creepy show that runs usually every halloween season here and this year it's just back as creep 2021 and it is a three-part show you start in a kind of sultry bar with some uh characters running around there they are all masked as are you and they'll they'll tell you about what's going on in their in their world it's this this house that's appeared and uh people go into it they don't come out then you'll you'll take a little journey into the town around that house and you'll you'll learn a little bit more about it and then of course you will enter the house and it is creeps version of a haunted house so these uh, you'll get these cool scenes that play out that kind of talk about who's who's been stuck there and and why and it's it's this fun haunted house vibe through creeps lens and it is a blast and i i it's like a, try to be good with words but it's, it's just fun and it's it's what you want out of kind of a, a halloween immersive theme show and it's it's great and if you want to find out more about uh the show outside of going to creepla.com and kevin's going to have a full review if you go back a few episodes back we uh we did a little feature on the build of it and talked to the creative team so you can find that in the podcast feed and i concur with kevin uh, a lot of fun but uh, but this is a this is a different kind of pick of the week this week, isn't it, Kevin? It it sure is because I'm 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 also here to introduce this week's pick of the week. Um, <laughs> how how weird is that? So uh, uh, I'm Kevin Gossett, the LA Reviews editor, and each week we publish the review rundown and we gather for the review crew. No, no, already talked about this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this what week, is time? Uh, what is space? This week's second pick of the week is brought to us by. I'm Noah Nilsson. I'm the host of this production, and, and our co-pick of the week this week is Delusion Reaper's Remorse from creator John Braver and Thirteenth Floor Entertainment. Uh, Delusion also a Los Angeles perennial, um, although usually kind of like every other year, but what is time? What is space in the year 2021? Um, delusion for, for all that creep is like, you know, sexy, arty, weird haunted house. Uh, delusion is interactive theater meets video game, living, living horror adventure game. Uh, this year's Reaper's Remorse, the, the central idea is that you've been invited to a party by this woman who collects these cursed objects. 
turns out she's the reason why they're cursed and she needs to manage this curse she's living under and you are conscripted into um, helping her solve a problem kind of against your will, you could say. Gonna leave it a little obscure there. What always works so well with delusion is when delusion hits, you feel like you're inside a movie. It's very cinematic. You feel like you're inside of an old adventure game. You get these moments where you get to kind of move the plot along bit by bit. And the acting uh, is is really fantastic. And all of the characters are kind of living in this heightened melodramatic reality. And they they treat you like you belong in that heightened melodramatic reality with them. And the more you lean into their vibe, the better the more fun you wind up having. Um, Just, I, I always love running around uh, the inside these kind of uh, play sets that, if you will, that uh, the delusion team makes. And um, it isn't necessarily as narratively ambitious as they've been in the past, but just a super solid addition uh, in a year when we need some solid entertainment uh, and when it's been so long since we've gotten to do anything like this. So just, just, just a lot of fun, just a lot of fun. Thanks for that, Noah. And that's uh, the second pick of the week. Yeah. And if you're wondering why we went and did two this time, uh, frankly, uh, they, they ran their, uh, <laughs> they ran their press nights, like within a couple of days of each other. Uh, and so if they'd been spaced out a week, they would have been like on their own. But, uh, at the end of the day, the pick of the week, really, we could look at it this way. Here's the framing. The pick of the week this week is Los Angeles' spooky season. Because if you like Halloween time, there ain't no better place in the world to be than in Southern California between like after Labor Day until Halloween. And ain't that the truth? Yeah, we're back, baby. (laughs) That we are. Joining us now is Julie Tremblay, the executive producer of Exhibits and Installations for Phi Studio up in Montreal. Julie, thank you for joining us today. Hello, Noah. Thank you for inviting me. We're going to talk about The Infinite, and we we had uh, Felix Lajanez on a couple of weeks ago to talk about the virtual reality side of the exhibit, but we wanted to talk to you uh, because Phi Studio is, is building it. <laughs> we wanted to talk to you about the installation side of things. So from that point of view, what is The Infinite? The intention of the infinite is to uh, bring you closer to space um, that you could never be in. Um, so it's really a narrative journey through space where there's uh, multiple rooms uh, where you're going to experience different things. And part of the experience is in VR, but it's not all about VR. It's also about um, projections, um, video content, uh, lighting, um, and it's really a, a journey to space that we're trying to uh, to bring the visitor on. How does that manifest? We've been working a lot with um, really high walls and trying to work with the um, the, the high ceiling, having everything like a, um, bigger than nature to really mm. explore the immensity of space. Uh, so when you come aboard the uh, the infinite experience, you're gonna first experience um, a takeoff, um, have the sensi- not the sensation, but hear um, the astronaut um, speak about the emotions um, that you feel when you have to left everything behind and when you're ready to go to space. And we really wanted to uh, project the visitors in that mindset. Uh, before they enter the uh, what we call the onboarding zone, uh, where they will put um, all the gear on and, and get ready to enter the space. Um, so um, that's the first steps of the journey. And then um, the visitor will enter a 6,000 square footage uh, space um, where um, the ISS will come in front of them and they will be invited to travel um, uh, in the ISS and discover all the content that was shot by Felix and Paul inside the uh, International Space Station. 
Um, and then at the end of that uh, exploratory moment of 30 minutes that I'm sure Felix described, um, visitor will be invited to, uh, in the virtual world, they are going to see a seat. They're going to be invited to sit down and to have a contemplative moment of um, the overview effect and how you perceive um, the Earth when you're uh, aboard the ISS. Um, that's a, a, a seven-minute, sorry, a seven-minute uh, film. Um, and when they take off their headsets after, they will be um, invited to a room um, where we um, uh, commission a piece from uh, Ryuji Ikeda, which is a Japanese um, uh, contemporary artist. Uh, it's, um, it's a room where you have an LED screen um, of seven meters by seven meters. So it's extremely impressive. And you're submerged under that video projection wall. Um, and on the floor, there's a huge um, mirror. So you have a kind of a vertige sensation of uh, what it could feel um, to be floating in space. Um, this is a 10 minute piece. And then uh, the journey is going to bring you through uh, what we call the wormhole where is um, your way back to Earth. Uh, so it's also um, a mirror room uh, where you have videos on the wall and you have the sensation we're trying to work with speed and light uh, to uh, give you a sensation of coming back on Earth. And in the last room of the exhibit, uh, you will be in a... Uh, you're, you're back, uh, your feet are back on Earth and you have this wonderful light beam coming up from the sun that is um, entering the room. And that's, you know, your way to, uh, to get out of the, uh, of the experience. So it's a 60-minute journey uh, overall. When, when I was imagining it, I, I didn't realize that so much of the installation part was, was on the kind of the back end and on, on, on bringing you back to Earth as part of the journey. Uh, could you maybe talk to a little bit about, about that choice to like kind of have so much after the VR bit. Cause I think in, in a lot of the, the installation pieces at museums I've seen that have, if they've been particularly large, like, um, you know, Carnegie arena when, when yeah. that, which I'm, which I know, you know, um, you know, there's the opening moment, you know, kind of setting, setting the mood. And then you, you encounter the space and that, that big sandbox and all, and, and you do have uh, an offboarding where there's that that haunting and lovely collection of, of portraits that like tell stories as as you kind of walk and leave, but it's 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 definitely you know sort of weighted on that entry moment to to set the mood and tone there. So uh, yeah, like, like talk us through this a little bit. Uh, this this is such an interesting choice. It was really part of the initial intention of the project where um, it was not all about VR. We really wanted to make a project where um, art and technology will come together. Um, and when we were looking at um, what exists out there um, in terms of uh, exhibition about space, uh, there's a lot of uh, artifacts. You know, you're discovering uh, old gear, old uh, uh, artifact from spaces and we really wanted to go away from that and create a balanced experience where yes and um, we will be talking um, uh, about VR and uh, amateur and, and lovers but we really wanted to reach out also to uh, people that are more um, interested in contemplative narrative and um, so the offboarding was not necessarily only an offboarding of going out of the VR experience, but it has to become an experience itself. Um, so I think it, we, we really wanted to balance that from the beginning. It was part of the assumptions. And that's what we've, we've tried um, to accomplish. And I, I think it's, it's working pretty well because you're having this 35 minutes in VR where you're honestly, I think, you know, we, I, I have the, the, the privilege to um, hearing people coming out of the experience almost every day. And people are blown away um, by the emotion they just um, encountered. Uh, but, but you need a moment to, uh, to come back to, from that. Um, and you need to be in a contemplative mode um, to really uh, get back to earth. And that's what we've, we've tried to, uh, to convey throughout the rest of the experience. This thinking around giving the guests 
a chance to, to, to stay in the moment and, and absorb what they've encountered. Is this something that you've kind of like uncovered over the course of doing the work or, or was, was that, uh, I don't, and I don't just mean the infinite. I mean like the, all yeah. of the work that, that, that you've been doing with Fi studio or, or is this something kind of like, that, you know, a theory that you tested that is playing out? I, I think it's, it's years of experience. Um, we've been, you know, uh, Fi has been presenting VR for more than five years. I, I like to say to the team that we're probably the institution who's presented the most uh, VR exhibit in the past. And, and we've seen, you know, sometimes you're working on an exhibit flow uh, where you need your visitors to move from one station to another and immerse themselves into another environment uh, quickly. And, and people don't appreciate that. They, they really wanted to um, uh, take on the piece, absorb the content and have a, have a pause, have a moment where they can really, um, you know, get their heads around what they've just um, experienced. Um, so it, it was important for us to, to, to uh, take into consideration all of these learnings that we've done over the past years. Um, and, and Infinite has been a, a good way for us to test. Um, you know, normally we are more into a, a presenter role where we are welcoming peace um, inside of Phi Center. Um, and now this time we had the opportunity to think about it and see how we wanted to envision this for the visitors. Um, and, and it was a privilege to be able to really adjust, you know, how the experience and the flow will be designed um, to make sure that we address um, how the, um, the visitor is feeling. Now, you, you mentioned presenting work at the Phi Center, and, I, and I'm very familiar from our own listings of, of how much work passes through. But, but there is Phi Center and Phi Studio. Could, could you talk about the relationship between these entities uh, and sort of the, the evolution of, of the, the company? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phi, Phi Centers has always been, uh, it's been, it's going to be 10 years um, that uh, Phi Centers is open um, next year in 2022. Um, and I would say that for about six years, we've been presenting um, VR exhibitions and uh, music shows. Um, it's really a destination in Montreal to experiment art. And we've taken positioning of uh, um, presenting the best of art and technology. So that's really the focus of Phi Center. But over the last two years, we've started um, working now with collaborators um, and getting involved in the development of the piece itself. Um, so it started with um, how can we present the piece um, in terms of a scenography of onboarding of offboarding. Uh, but then um, we, we welcome a first um, a resident artist, um, Diego Galafasi, uh, in 2019. And we've developed a, a, magic, uh, a magic leap, an augmented reality piece called Breathe that we presented to Sundance. So that's a little bit um, our first, uh, how the studio was born. We realized that, you know, yes, we wanted to present um, the piece, but we also wanted to contribute to it. And not necessarily in terms of scenography, but also in terms of developing uh, content. Um, and that's the, the way also we, we kind of work with Felix and Paul on the infinite is that um, we've worked, uh, some of our team members work with the interactive team at Felix and Paul to really envision um, the narrative of this experience. How much does working hand in hand with the artist allow you to tailor make the guest experience when it comes to presenting these works? It's so important. Um, it allows us really to, to, to make sure that the creative vision of the artist is going to be um, at its best um, for the visitors, that all of the point of contact with the piece will communicate the emotion that was intent and the vision that was um, intent at the beginning. So closer, we can start working with the artist um, on its piece. Um, better, I think it will be for um, the visitors. The connection will be there. Um, and, and, and also, it, there's so much learning on looking at how people are experiencing VR. And, and, and just with the infinite, you know, we've, we've every day, that we go and that we look at how people are um, navigating through the space, 
we have so much learning, some um, interactions that we take for granted, that we think, no, people will know what they have to do. We realize that it's not necessarily clear for some of our audience members. Um, and more we learn um, in terms of audience and where they are also with their um, learning um, of the uh, technology. You know, a lot of visitors, uh, when you welcome a, a thousand guests a day, uh, like we do right now, a lot of the visitors are at their first contact with the technology. So all of these learnings uh, need to be integrated in the piece um, and in the artist's vision to make sure that what he's trying to convey is going to be understand, uh, understood. Sorry. Oh, no. What excites you about working on this stuff? Innovation. Like every day you're going to do something different. And I love when the team, we sit down and we're like, okay, but how can we do that? You know, the, the first time we say we said we're going to be able in this model to welcome 1,400 visitors a day in VR, I, I just, that's the challenge. How are we going to do that and make sure that people don't feel the technology, they are not rushed, they have the time to enjoy it, Um I think it's it, it's it's um, it's the challenge that the industry needs to uh, to address right now and to think of, and 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 I really um, I, it's it's extremely stimulating to be uh, thinking of that and finding solutions to these problems. Julie, I believe uh, the infant's going to be running for a little bit longer uh, there at the Phi Center, correct? We are at L'Arsenal um, in Old Montreal, in, a, in, in a Griffin Town in Montreal. Um, Phi Center is too small to welcome the <laughs> infinite. It's okay. a 12,000 12, square footage um, experience. So it's huge. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. But, but, but the run's still going right now, right? Yes. yes. Uh, until November 7. And then we are moving to uh, Houston and we are going to open in Houston on uh, December the 20th. And then uh, is there is there anything that's on the horizon for Phi that we should keep an eye out for? A uh, mini co-production project is coming up, um, but all um, in development right now. So more to come soon. All right. Julie, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Noah. It was a pleasure. Come to the end of the show, but do stick around because we've got a few more announcements to come. Uh, I do want to thank Clem and Julie for being our guests. I want to thank Catherine for handling the headlines and Kevin for co-anchoring the pick of the week with me this week. There is a lot going on. Uh, and let's start with the next stage. We announced two new speakers this week, adding them to the lineup. We've got even more getting added on next week. Uh, and we're going to start also rolling out and letting everyone know uh, from the, the request for proposals uh, who we're bringing on a lot of exciting folks there. But right now, uh, very pleased to announce that Arisa Puno, creator of The Privilege of Escape, who was tapped as one of our Horizon speakers for 2020, is on board to appear coming up January 7th, 8th, and 9th at the Pasadena Playhouse this coming year. Um, it's going to be so good to close the loop and get Arisa on stage and talking. Also uh, joining us, uh, and uh, he was he was going to be a surprise at 2020. Uh, that uh, is Hamish A. Jenkinson. Uh, Hamish is a, you know one of the co-founders of the department in the UK. Uh, they work on some really large uh, experiential activations on the marketing side of things. But Hamish, like so many of us, has his roots in theater. He founded the London Old Vic Tunnels uh, back in the day. And uh, nowadays, uh, the department works with uh, some of the world's biggest brands, FIFA, BMW, the BBC. They actually just did a giant projection mapping job on a BMW's headquarters. Um, I think I got that right. I think it's the headquarters. 
Uh, the department also announced not too long ago that they uh, struck a deal with Warner Brothers uh, to do some stuff with the uh, DC Comics characters. So that's interesting. At least I think it's interesting. Uh, that was in the trades a little while ago. So yeah, uh, Hamish is going to be around to talk. And uh, so is Arisa. And we've got a few more folks we're going to be announcing next week and a whole bunch more that we're in negotiations with. If you were a 2020 badge holder, you are able to buy passes, badges now. Uh, i got to be careful. There's streaming passes and there's on-site badges. You're able to buy badges now. The codes which have your proper discount are being emailed to you uh, here on October 1st and over October 2nd. I'm doing all this work by hand, so it goes slow. <laughs> I wish it was otherwise, but it takes a while. So uh, just slowly getting through everybody. Uh, we got about a third of the codes are already out. Uh, the next two thirds will go out in these next two days. It's what I'm just gonna get to spend my Friday evening doing. It's, it's really, really fun. It's not fun at all. It's tedious. Uh, but we do it and we do it that way because we want to make sure that we honor what we promised. So for everyone else, badges are going to go on sale October 13th. Teenth. That's when badges go on sale, and the price is six hundred and fifty dollars for the three-day event. And we are going to have festival elements at this year's event. So the next stage is a summit with a micro festival, and very excited. Uh, we're going to be announcing some of the festival components soon, and getting that all back together, um, doing the thing. We wanted to do and set out to do and hey we are looking for in fact let me let me package this next bit together all right i hope you're still around this is our, our october pledge drive for no pro but remember no pro is is transforming the the organization's transforming into the immersive experience institute we do have a fiscal sponsor in the form of producer hub and we are able to take donations, nonprofit donations. Uh, if you want to invest in our long-term uh, existence and the work that we're doing, um, contact us, contact me, Noah at nopersinium.com, and we can talk about that. Uh, if you want to sponsor the next stage specifically, uh, we have a whole thing there. Uh, Jacob Patterson, formerly of Think Tank, these days of hijinks, uh, can be reached at jacob at hijinksarts.com. That's if you want to get involved in the sponsorship of the next stage event. And we've got all kinds of tiers uh, ready to go uh, from, from little things to just make it a big splash if you represent a big company. Um, eager to get that underway. But our lifeblood, our day-to-day -day is the Patreon. And I do want to thank our latest Patreon backer. That would be Stackhouse, who came on uh, this week. But I also want to announce uh, we're 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 bleeding right now. Uh, we just today I just found out right before I was recording this that we lost one of our sustaining backers. Um, it happens. Uh, don't know why. It, sometimes things just happen. Sometimes people drop out. They come back. It, all sorts of reasons why. Sometimes people find it's like oh they're not interested in this anymore. I don't know. Don't know why. Maybe I'll find out. They didn't reach out. It's okay. Not angry. Not upset. Oh, not upset with them. Upset with, with the world. Uh, look, I'm not an eccentric millionaire uh, who does this for fun. I wish I was. I really wish I was. Because because that'd be awesome in so many ways. And I, I do good things. So wish me luck with the lotto this week. It's a lot of money. Um, right now, we've got about $2,000 a month coming into the Patreon. I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> These things don't add up. I'm also, I've gone into pretty significant debt over the past decade, making all this stuff happen. And with the pandemic, even more making sure that we didn't disappear. If that debt didn't exist, the 2000 a month we got off the Patreon, it'd be enough for me to squeak by, but it does. Oh, it does. So just to be blunt, if the fortunes don't change in the macro sense, whether that means getting some some big donors in to fund the Institute or vastly increasing the small dollar donations we get off of Patreon, we're only looking for two or five dollars a month. If 
we can't make the dynamic change, we can't create some more resilience in the system, I will be, I will be back to freelancing and we will be dialing back what we do majorly, just majorly. There's, there's no way around it. And I don't want to do that. I want to expand. I want to expand what we're doing. I'm very excited about the prospect of, 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 of making more no pro of making, uh, creating the labs for the Institute of doing more events and also being able to take, you know, <laughs> the imaginary free time I have and using that to help organize even outside of these channels. Um, but we just, we need your help. We do. I do. I need your help. Um, if you already give, I don't want you to give more. I really don't because that just scares me, all right? When we get big backers, it scares me because we lose one like we lose today and 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 it's 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 a psychic damage. I can't take any more psychic damage. <laughs> My meter's maxed out. Um, if you're already giving at patreon.com slash no proscenium, let people know about the work we do. If we spread the word, we increase the net, and uh, we, we've got a relatively good conversion rate. So we just, if we can increase things. The sign I'm looking for is for us to hit 400 backers by the end of the year. Not the end of the month, by the end of the year. That's And we have 341 right now. So we've got three months, three months, 20 backers a month, $2, $5, that's it cost of like a cup of coffee a latte a month and that'll give us what we need to keep on expanding to make the case to demonstrate to the folks who are thinking about giving us institutional style money who want to make a real you know investment not with a sense of getting roi getting cash back but a sense of like deepening this community they'll look at the numbers they'll see that we have 400 backers and they'll be like oh this is a real thing right it's not just that they have this many thousand people in their Facebook group and this many, you know, hundreds of people in their Discord and this many thousands of people on their social. Like, there's people who are putting money into this. That means a lot. And I think, you know, we do good work. And we'd like to do better work. And we need you to help spread the word. And for those of you who haven't given yet. So that's the beginning of the pledge drive. If you have bigger resources and you want to sponsor the summit, reach out to me, reach out to Jacob. If you want to sponsor the Institute, reach out to me. We can make things happen. <laughs> we can make things happen. You can make things happen. And if you know those who could make a difference for us, please. Or if you know what the lotto numbers are going to be on <laughs> Saturday, <laughs> Tell me those now. There's still time. Don't tell me the Saturday numbers on Sunday. I won't find it funny. Um, okay. That's that's all that. Let's get you out of here before the hour's done. Thank you for listening, if you're still listening. It's uncomfortable for me, too. Uh, but I gotta do it. Um, please spread the word. Please. The sustaining backers. The people are still with us. Uh, for No Persinium are Ari Hurston, Brittany, Deborah Robinson, Elaine, Jay Bushman, David Bassick, Lonnie Hanson, Paul Farnell, Mark Baltazar, no, Mark Baltazar, Samuel Mustry, Sidney Guillory, and Jan Budman. Thank you all. Uh, I, 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 I know it's, it's, it's a lot. The associate producer of No Persinium, the podcast, is Parker Sella. Music for No Persinium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society. Special thanks to Siobhan Lachlan for voicing our intro. Catherine Yu is the executive editor at No Pro. And this monstrosity is all my fault. I'm Noah Nelson. And until next time, I'll see you at the show. <laughs>